right, hello, good morning, and welcome to the show. This is Good Morning Ghana Live on Metro TV. Well, it is um, a Wednesday, quite a wet Wednesday morning here in the capital. It's the third day of July 2024. By His Grace, we're live and we're here. We're at another edition of the show. Our gratitude will go to Most High God for the very privilege of being alive and, of course, the opportunity of having another conversation around the top stories making around here in our dear republic i'll let you into our panel for the morning's conversation shortly well let's take a look at the front pages of our newspapers daily graphic achieving the sdgs extend debt relief to africa president Ekufado tells development partners ambulances were not fit for purpose because jackpot gbc rolls out digital media structure Stan Chat posts 1.3 billion cities profit before tax. Irregularities decline in latest Auditor General's reports. The Ghanaian Times. Accra begins major cleanup exercise. Regional Minister Gamanchi Accra may a leader forced to clean city of filth. Diligently scrutinize financial agreements and loans before approval as something in task parliament. At Maiden Courtly Economic Roundtable, stop announcing new taxes to increase revenue. Rather, improve efficiency in tax collection, Dr. Sowa. Let's prioritize human capital development towards attainment of SDGs. President appeals to African leaders. Daily Guide. 2.37 million euros ambulance is not fit for purpose, Japa admits. SDGs, Action Summit. Nana pushes for more youth investment. NDC MPs boycott vetting. EC reopens transfer of votes. Government launches 1.5 million cities hydro fund. A new crusading guide. 2.37 million euros financial loss trial. First 10 ambulances were only meant to be packed. Jackpot. Government allocates 1.5 million cities to tackle flood and drainage. Upon Krum announces as it launches hydro fund. EC to reopen applications for votes transfer. Universities, prisons and media. Ministry of Health workers demand shake up. As saboteurs surround minister. Road safety improvement measures introduced. President Kufado's four point agenda to accelerate SDG's implementation. Keeping Accra clean. Gamanche mayor lead on slot against filth. The insight. Galamse, mining engineer says Kufado's approach to tackling men is wrong. Looting of state lands hit Supreme Court as Judicial Service Hughes AG and two others over sale of judges' bangalows. Scrapping Council of State for second chamber good idea. Political scientist backs Alan's proposal. Nungwa still signs MOU with prestige group to manage its landed properties. Colombian social movements reject U.S. Colombia military exercises in Pacific Ocean. The Herald. Judicial Council boldly stands up to a Kufado and Chief Justice. Rejects additional Supreme Court judges. Stanchard Ghana announces dividend payout amid strong 2023 performance. NHI is on new trajectory under Da Costa Bwaji. Dubai company storms caught next Thursday on ambulance case as Japa reveals government elements dumped accessories at Tema Port. Ho High Court sets 29th July for Amehu's judgment. Minister runs from witness box. The informer. Citizens despondency in democracy. Francis Poku raises red flag. Elections 2024, IMF warns Ghana against reckless expenditure. Grabbing of judges' bungalows, attorney general, lands commission sued. Ramadan rice case, court throws out Issa Seydou over ownership of Lele Rice. Claim to celebrate Homo War campaign. Zoom Lion partners, Gamanche, others to read a crowd filth. The Inquisitor, IGP Conconcertive Probe, extrajudicial killings pop up. As Highlands attack committee chairman, Gamanche, ministers, others, clean Accra, Chairman Sabonsu, OK's DMB, Napo combination, COSA calls for collaboration to solve urban mobility and accessibility challenges. Ghana Link wins huge at Ghana Shippers Awards. The Daily Statesman, President lays out solid plan to accelerate SDG's implementation. Minister Edges joint effort on urban accessibility solutions. Works and Housing Minister launches Hydro Fund. Gamanche leads sanitation crusade in Accra. The Ghanaian publisher. Government sets up hydrological fund to address drainage and dredging challenges. 
Gamanche ministers clean a crowd. Finance minister slams minorities and patriotic conduct. Financing gap threat to Africa's SDGs, President Ekufuado. The Accra Times. Quality of democracy is determined by parliament, Bagbin. Information minister briefs parliament on RTI 2024 outlook. Gregory Afoko's family worried over GBA's hypocrisy and selective condemnation of human rights abuses and yet to even acknowledge receipt of a petition by the family a year ago. Concomba culture, a rich heritage worth preserving. Baumier's VIP choice, the season solid and serious Dr. Poku Prempe. The new finder, 1.5 million cities allocated to hydrological fund, acid money to mitigating flood risks, improving water management. Experts stress strict fiscal discipline to support economic recovery. President outlines four-point agenda to accelerate SDGs implementation. Prosecution of persons behind financial sector mess too slow, Dr. Addison. Glocksack declares nationwide strike. Daily Post of 2024 election and vigilantism. Is a Kufuado planning another murder spree as happened in 2020? Military personnel are trained to shoot and kill. They must not be involved in election security. Chieftaincy Minister. <coughs> Protecting the national press from a Kufuado and his cronies. We cannot be silenced, says Ablakwa. You will lose our votes if you stick with arrogant Napo as running mate. Pro NPP group caution Baumia. And that's about it. For the front pages, we'll be back shortly. Right, welcome back to the show. If you just joined us, this is Good Morning Ghana Live on Metro TV. Uh, with me on the show this morning, I have Kwesi Pratt Jr., who's the managing editor of the Inside Newspaper. Kwesi, good morning. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Also with me on the show this morning is a government spokesperson who is also a member of the Baumia 2024 campaign team, Eric Abmuakuchum. Eric, good morning. Good morning, Randy. Right, right, right. Kwesi, Monday was 1st of July, you know. Uh, how did you spend it? You know, I'm still, I, I'm still in my withdrawal syndrome mode. You know, to, 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 to get up and know that the 1st of July is not a holiday. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, you wake up with the feeling that it's a holiday. Mm. Then you realize that it's not a holiday. Mm. And then the, the, there's a flash. And you begin to wonder why. I mean, it's, it's really incredible that any government will seek to downgrade the 1st of July, especially a government which pretends to be interested in who the founder of Ghana is and who really struggled for national independence. Because it's obvious that 1st of July is actually the culmination of, of our victory over colonialism, understand? The victory over colonialism came in three phases. The first phase, obviously, was in 1951, when Nkrumah became the, 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 the leader of government business. And then in July, no, no, on March 6, 1957, when we achieved partial independence, and our full independence was really achieved on the 1st of July, 1960, when Ghana became a republic. And somehow, strangely, this government has come to the conclusion that the 1st of July is not important. It's, it's been really baffling, you know, exceedingly baffling. But of course, it does appear that there may be some reasons very bad reasons why government has decided that the 1st of July ought to be downgraded. And perhaps the, the most important reason is that if you take the 1st of July 1960, there cannot be any doubt that the main architect of the Republican status was Kwame Nkrumah as leader of the Convention People's Party. There's no doubt at all. 
that he was there <coughs> actually there. So if you're moving on the trajectory that you didn't contribute as much as others to Ghana's independence, you would try by all means to avoid the 1st of July in order to be able to denigrate his efforts at, at national independence and so on. So that may be the reason. Bad as it is, it may be the reason. Of course, the other reason simply has to do with the fact that you have a government in power which traces its antecedents to personalities and institutions which openly, openly did not favor the achievement of independence on 6 March 1957. Of course, the historical record shows the delegation which went to England to plead with the British not to hand over you know, the reins of government to the Ghanaian people at that time because we had not sufficiently learned the ways of the British and that it was important to delay you know, the achievement of independence. There were those who at that time insisted that we should still have the effigy of the Queen of England on our currency, rather than to have our own president's effigy on the currency and so on. So all of these things play you know, into the equation. And whilst we cannot be surprised at, at the, the institutions and personalities who are engaged clearly in this shenanigans, we would be surprised and have to be surprised at the fact that national independence is being downplayed you know, in this era of our history. <coughs> All right, so I'll get to um, um, you, Eric, uh, pretty shortly. But um, if you're out there looking for a toothpaste that will take care of the entire family and save you for mo some money, the recommended family toothpaste is Kel 360 toothpaste. This is approved by the Food and Drugs Authority. Kel 360 toothpaste provides you and your family with all around dental protection throughout the day with freshness. Kel 360 toothpaste is good for kids, children, and adults. Let your family be a proud family when they step out by constantly using Kel 360 toothpaste. Kel 360 toothpaste brightens your teeth, prevents cavity, and with its cool mint, gives you a fresh breath throughout the day and protects the gum from decaying. For consistency and quality, Use Kel 360 toothpaste. It's another product from Samara Company Limited, producers of Sasso. It's available in all supermarkets, malls, and provision shops. Call Samara Company on 0246 864 Kel 360 toothpaste, happy smile. And enjoying the fruits of your labor is as important as enjoying the mansions of your labor. The pains of climbing the stairs when not exercising could be challenging irrespective of your age. But worry no more. Lift and elevators have got you covered with the best portable American pneumatic vacuum elevators on the market today. It's a simple self-supported elevator for both homes and offices. And guess what? It can lift your goods too. Wheelchairs can fit in and they come in three custom-made models. <coughs> it's affordable and can be installed within three days. Visit lift and elevators at Sakumon or just call them on 0200-535-515 or send a mail. To elevators, gh at gmail.com for consultations and the best solutions in easy vertical movements. And the Institute of Paralegal Training and Leadership Studies, in collaboration with the Ghana National Association of ADR Practitioners and ADR International Register and ISO Certified Body, is offering internationally recognized industry driven conflict resolution and other specialized courses. These are a professional executive master in alternative dispute resolution, professional executive masters in general paralegal studies, professional executive master in chieftaincy law and sustainable development practice, professional executive master in industrial and labor relations and practice, professional executive master in family law and conflict resolution. And they have an exceptional team of facilitators who are well versed in their subject areas and are ready to equip participants with the skills they need to influence industry in the right direction. Individuals trained in ADR by them qualify for admission into the prestigious membership of the Ghana National Association of ADR Practitioners. For admissions, you can call the Institute of Paralegal Studies on 0303-960-798 or you can WhatsApp them on 509 
or send a mail to ipls.edu.gh at gmail.com. So, so Eric, if, 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 um, if our kids or anybody um, were to ask, 7th of January is a holiday, and that is the advent of the Fourth Republic. How come the First Republic, yes, so the Fourth Republic is the most enduring republic. Mm -hmm. How come the First Republic, that really gave you total political independence, is off the table? How, how, how do we explain that? Randy, um... And what would we have, <laughs> sorry, and what would we have lost if, right. for example, um, in believing that 7 January was such a big deal because it's the most enduring democracy and ought to be elevated, we had left the 1st of July, which also recognizes the fact that this is when we had our total political independence. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity once again. Good morning, Uncle Chrissy. And Randy, good morning to you as well. And of course, to the viewers um, this morning. I, I think that we all grew up with the fact that on the 1st of July, uh, it's a public holiday. So if you're a kid and you're in school, that becomes one of those things that you essentially looking forward to. Uh, but then I also took my time to look at the number of holidays that we have that basically does, if, if you like, the exact same thing, or even more. So we have the 6th of March, which, like um, Anquisi said, is significant in terms of the independence of this country and the fact that it's celebrated every year without, I mean, I'm not sure that we would ever get to a point where the 6th of March will not be celebrated in this country. And that's a national holiday. Then one of the things that he tried to talk about is the fact that it's almost like an attempt by a certain group of people to denigrate the legacy of certain persons, uh, i.e. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who is the first president of this country. But then I also realized that we're still celebrating uh, Nkrumah's birthday, which is the 21st of September, every year. And it's actually also a national holiday. Then we have the 4th of August, which is also a Founders Day that has, if you like, uh, Nkrumah also as a very prominent, uh, if you like, a key protagonist in the whole struggle for uh, this country, and is also celebrated on that particular day. Now, you just mentioned the 7th of January, which for me uh, has become very significant because at least every four years on the 7th of January, we usher in a new executive uh, to basically run the affairs of this country. And that's also celebrated. So that at least on a time, on a day that um, a president is being sworn in or that inauguration is being held, it becomes a holiday for all Ghanaians or people who live within the jurisdiction to also uh, be able to save the occasion. Uh, I don't think that the 1st of July in itself has been taken off completely. I mean, I think that when you read the, the Act, the Amendment Act, uh, together with the um, AU Day, which was also used to be a holiday, has become more commemorative. And you know, the significant conversation here is that almost every time that uh, there's a public holiday, you also have a certain group of people even questioning the rationale behind having so many public holidays within uh, this country. And, and so for me, I think that maybe the focus should be on when it gets to the 1st of July, when it comes to commemorating this particular day, which, of course, it's going to be significant in the way we govern our country and how our country has actually uh, come. We would have a conversation as to how we'll be able to remember this particular day and how significant it is for us going forward in terms of our development as a country. And so for me, I would focus more on what we do to commemorate that particular <coughs> day. Um, in terms of the ideological conversations and differences and uh, what pertain at that time, I mean, I'm sure if we start this conversation, 
we will not finish. Because there are always people who would have divergent views, and uh, there will also be schools of thought. You know, the last time we were speaking on a similar subject, I was talking about when you're doing O-level history, and you pick up an Edubayan uh, book, and you pick up an F.K. Boa book, and there's a certain account that was supposed to have been the same, you realize that there are different perspectives in terms of how these things are being reported. So for me, I, I believe that we've come a long way as a, as a people. Um, if we definitely have to go back into history to look at the mistakes that we've made, we should be able to do so. But this is 2024. I mean, I think that it's about time that we moved on from some of these things. And it's not in relation to a particular group of people, but I think that anytime these conversations come up, it basically opens a lot of old wounds and people become very sensitive and emotional and all of that. But, I mean, these are decisions that are taken. I know, for example, you have a constitution that gives the president the mandate to be able to uh, do some of these things. So for me, I feel that we have to move on. But if you ask the question, what can we do for our children to be able to understand the significance of the 1st of July. By all means, let's make sure that it is not lost on all of us. And it still remains a very important day and date in the history of this country. And uh, I think that we can move on, to be honest with you. All right, thank you. Really, there are two important issues which mm. need to be settled. Okay. And for me, the first important issue is the issue which my brother here has raised about the apparent wastefulness of so many holidays. Okay. The answer to that is very simple. Holidays should not mean that you should sleep and go to the beach and get drowned. Mm -hmm. You can use holidays for productive purposes. And there are many examples around the world. One example which comes to mind immediately is how the Cuban people were mobilized on holidays to harvest sugarcane. Which is, which is productive. So I agree with you to the extent that it is not just the declaration of a holiday which is important. It is how the holiday is celebrated and whether the holidays really contribute to our effort at nation building and so on. So you can have 500 holidays in a year. If you celebrate them productively, if the, if the celebration is geared towards you know, accelerating the pace of national development and so on, then you cannot be talking about the wastefulness of holidays. So that is clear. Now, the other thing for me is this fixation with the so-called second, third, and fourth republics. Yeah, he said that a few times. I mean, it's, it's a useless fixation because Ghana attained republican status only once. That was on 1st July 1960. And that status has not changed. The Ghana status as a republic, which was gained in 1960, 1st July, has never changed. So what is this fixation with Second Republic and Third Republic and Fourth Republic? Again, if you look very closely, it's the attempt to devalue the Republican status which was attained in 1960. It's just let to me say that, that, that Republic did not last. It lasted. It's let, lasted until today. Let, let me pick your mind on something. Yes, sir. To the extent that when these re Republics are interrupted via military or coup d'etats, <coughs> constitution, so let's say we are the first Republican constitution, that constitution is overthrown. The government is overthrown. Then, when the military decides to return us to um, democratic rule, then you have a process of drafting a new constitution, which is not the restoration of the earlier constitution. Is that not what gives credence to Second Republic, Third Republic, Fourth Republic? Yeah, well, that's lazy thinking, you understand? Mm. Because even under military rule, we still remain a republic. Yes. Even under military rule, 
we still remain a republic. As the Republic of Ghana. Exactly. So the Republican status is not affected by coup d'etats. Mm. And even when the Constitution is, 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 is as it were, suspended and so on, the Republican status remains intact. Because the new military regimes come up with proclamations, yes. which recognizes Ghana as, as a republic. We, yes, we, don't, so, we don't reverse to bring no, in the no, queen no, back as a ceremonial president. Well, as head of state. Yes, we don't do that. Yeah, we don't do that. So we remain a republic. <coughs> so we have been a republic since 1960, mm -hmm. and no military intervention has changed that Republican status. Okay. And I think we ought to understand that. Mm. Again, for those who are complaining that we have too many holidays and so on, if you take the 7th of January, mm. which is now a public holiday, I can understand it to the extent that the 7th of January is the day we hand over. There are all kinds of activities and ceremonies to mark that. So it does make sense. Uh, a lot of people would not go to work anyway. It does make sense to declare the 7th of January a, republic, a, a, a holiday. Mm. But why would you have four holidays in four years when the event is only one day in, in, in four years? So why can't we have a system which says that the 7th of, of January after every election is a holiday? So you save three holidays. And it is possible to do that, you understand? So I'm, I'm completely baffled by these new arrangements. And I really wish, I really wish that one day, one day sometime in the future, we would have a government which would recognize the 1st of July and insist that the 1st of July should be celebrated for what it is worth. And I also really wish that one day in the future, we'll have a government which will restore African Liberation Day. Because African Liberation Day is such an important... You mean the AU Day? That's what they call it now. <laughs> yes. But I still insist that it's the African Liberation Day. Okay. Now, one, because the national liberation struggle is not over in Africa yet. You still have the case of the Saudi Arab Democratic Republic which is under colonial occupation. Okay. You still have the case of the Chagos Islands, which are still under colonial occupation. And if you add the diaspora, then you still have West Papua, which is also under colonial occupation. So we cannot be pretending that the national liberation struggle in Africa is over. Again, if you go back to history, and you look at the definition of national liberation, which was provided by the final resolution of the Pan-African Congress in Manchester in 1945, the national liberation struggle is not over because the national liberation struggle had different components. And of course, the first component was the right of the African people to choose their own path of development and also the right of the African people to elect their own leaders who did not exist under colonialism. Okay, so that's an important component. Even that, I'm not so sure that we have achieved that now. The second component being the right of the African people to own their own resources and to exploit these resources for their own benefit, which we haven't achieved now. So the national liberation struggle has not come to an end. And uh, I'm really surprised, you know, that current African governments are playing down uh, the African Liberation Day, watering it down significantly, and so on. And it does appear. But, but, see, don't you think that the issue, what you, especially what you just raised, and even, I mean, to an extent, that of the Republic Day, um, have become issues because, you know, Eric hinted that, oh, they have not been scrapped completely. Yes, 1st July is no longer a holiday, but it's a commemorative day. Same as 25th of May. It's supposed to be a commemorative day. That's what the memorandum said, and that's what it's supposed to be. But the key issue 
for me, and this is why I raise this issue with you, is that if we see a commemorative day, what do we do on those days to ensure that indeed we recognize those days and we are commemorating those days? Because first July just passed. So for a country that says that it is now a commemorative day, on that day, what did the Republic of Ghana do? Same as the May 25 that you're talking about. If we even say that we have too many holidays, we will not, it will not be a holiday, but it's a commemorative day. There's a reason why we said that it's a commemorative day, which presupposes that we appreciate the fact that that day represents something and ought to be commemorated. However, we don't want that to be a public holiday. But what we do to advance that thing is what is critical. So the point again is that on those commemorative days, what have we done? And what did we do just last Monday? Because on May 25, we see we can do a lot of things which will bring to the fore all the issues that you have raised without necessarily making the day a holiday. But it appears, it appears like, well, maybe we just put a commemorative day, day there just to create the impression that, look, yeah, we appreciate that it represents something. But then, when it comes to actually doing something, it's zero. Randy, to some extent, I would agree with you. To some extent, you're absolutely right. And I think both Eric and I have made that point. But the most important thing is what you do on the day. If it's a public holiday and you don't want it to be wasteful, you can actually plan activities which would ensure that the day is not wasted. Clean up activities, you know, focus on national agriculture, focus on education and so on, so that the day is not wasted. So even commemorative days, we can plan activities, we can do things which emphasizes the importance that we attach to that day. Mm -hmm. But there's no doubt, and there cannot be any doubt, that reducing July 1st, from a public holiday to a commemorative day, is a downgrade. It's a downgrade. And you believe that it's deliberate? Oh, of course. I mean, why would government, you know, spend time drafting legislation, putting it before government and so on, if it's not deliberate? It was deliberate. And I get worried because it was part of the package. Huh? We sought to de-emphasize the role of Kwame Nkrumah in the achievement of national independence. And it's not just about the role of an individual in the achievement of national independence. It's also about the objectives, huh? the principles, the ideals, you know, which guided the struggle for national independence and which guided the struggle for the attainment of Republican status. You know, two days ago, um, a book was launched at the International Conference Center, a book which was authored by Dr. Eugene Don Atta. I don't know if you've heard about the book. It's a you historical about book. It. I've read the book. And Eric, frankly, I think it's one of the best history books ever authored about Ghana. I mean, in the past, I'd rated, you know, uh, 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 Basil Davidson's book, The Black Star of Africa, as, as the best historical account. But I've read Dr. Don Atta's book, which was launched only two days ago, and, and I think, in all honesty, that it is the best historical record. Now, why do I think so? This book makes copious references to documents, authentic documents, you know, quotations of those involved in colonial administrations and so on. It's a 500-page book. The index is classic and so on. And I've learned a lot. <coughs> now, Randy, there, there's something in that book, the very early part of the book, page, I think it's page six or so of the book, as part of the introduction. One of the quotations which the book brings forth is a quotation from the Lord Frederick Lugard. And I'm sure all of you will remember the Lord Frederick Lugard. Because earlier historians had credited him with being the person who propounded the theory of indirect rule. 
and, and decay, the principal administrator of the principle of indirect rule and so on. Of course, that account is not true. Because if you look at history very closely, the idea of indirect rule came from the girlfriend of the Lord Frederick uh, 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 Lugard. You know, it, was, it was an idea that his girlfriend, who happened to be a journalist, actually put forward, uh, and so on. Even naming of Nigeria was a product of his girlfriend's work. The girlfriend was a journalist and so on. But that's not the point. The point is the quotation which was published in this book. And in that quotation, Lord Lugard says that, look, <coughs> after some time, these Africans, and he refers to us as Negroes, which is very offensive, okay? But then he says that these Africans would rise up against us. They would drive us out of their land. But we have to take measures to ensure that even after independence, we'll control these Negroes and make these Negroes believe that of all white people in the world, the British people, British white men, are their natural allies. Direct quotation. So what was the independence project from the British point of view? The independence project from the British point of view, according to Lord Lugard, was to hand over to their agents, their collaborators, and the chiefs. Okay. So Nkrumah completely upset that plan of the British and brought the masses of the people into the forefront of the struggle. And no doubt that on February 24, 1966, the British intelligence services, in collaboration with the US intelligence services, decided to overthrow the Nkrumah government to return us to what you may call the status quo ante. Okay, so the 1966 coup was just to return us to the status quo ante, to the status quo which they, the British, wanted for their agents, their collaborators, and their chiefs to be in the center of the, of the governing machine, you know, of, of Ghana and, and so on. It's clear. Now, I want to believe that some things have happened since February 24, 1966, which affirm the implementation of the strategy. I cannot understand for one moment why our foremost international airport is still named after Kotoka. I cannot. Especially as some of the prominent coup plotters have come to denounce the coup. I had the privilege of interviewing Mr. A.K. Deku, who was an architect of the coup, a few weeks before he died. And that interview is available. In which Commissioner of Police A.K. Deku declares that as far as he's concerned, the best leader Ghana has had is Kwame Nkrumah. I then asked him, if Kwame Nkrumah was the best leader that we have had, since independence. Why did you participate in overthrowing him? And his answer was that, look, the conspiracy had been hatched in such a way that if he decided not to go along, he would have been killed and that the coup would have occurred anyway. It's A.K. Deku. It's A.K. Deku who took part in the coup. So after all of these confessions by persons who were involved in the plot and so on, why do we still insist on remaining on this path of recklessness with the values of history? I cannot understand. Okay. I, I simply cannot understand. Okay. You know. And if you like, I'll send you a copy of the interview. You can play it on your network. I, as a matter of fact, I did the interview for TV3. I watched it. Oh, you watched it? Yes, yeah, I watched it. Yes. I watched it. Yes. Okay. No, no, I was just trying to... Um, comment on even the commemoration of the holidays and what we do with it. For example, in most uh, other parts of the world, we, we have, they have what they call the bank holidays, right? So the day itself will still be commemorated, but for purposes of the celebrations and what it does, even for people to travel back to their families and all of that, the day is set aside is usually a Monday 
um, after the, that particular holiday. And then they actually give those Mondays as holidays so that people would have longer weekends to go and do all sorts of other social events and all of that. So uh, if, even when people talk about productivity and, I mean, the essence of giving out some of these holidays, I think that these are some of the things that we can probably also uh, learn from. So that usually what tends to happen is that, for example, you have a holiday in the middle of the week on a Wednesday and a Thursday, people have to go back to work or, you know, stuff like that. I think that there are things that we can, we can actually uh, take a, a note of and then use. All right. <coughs> Let's get on to, to, to your, your party and your candidate. So last week, we, we heard of um, um, a meeting, mm -hmm. a Zoom meeting between uh, Alaji Baumia and uh, uh, President Akufado. And we're told that that was when um, uh, the vice president communicated his choice to the president. And that then paved the way for uh, all media houses to mm -hmm. then publish that um, uh, Napu gets the nod, he is the man. Um, subsequent to that, we've seen a, a notice um, indicating that tomorrow there will be a national council meeting. A neck, a neck council, and a national council meeting tomorrow, and obviously the agenda is to um, deal with with that. <coughs> In the last few days, we've also seen um, photographs um, and stories, uh, apparently uh, giving us the impression that indeed there's a move to either reconcile or mend uh, fences. So we've seen one. Um, the um, Alaji uh, Baumia uh, uh, Napo uh, Untumi and others. We've also seen um, a story that says that the parliamentary caucus has met the flag bearer. They support his choice. Uh, we've also seen one headline today talk about Jose uh, Chairman Sabonso. Obviously. He's part of a caucus, but they say that was achievements I was, and I'm sure he had to do with that interview. Granted, and said that uh, uh, doctor doesn't need uh, any uh, arrogant, uh, hot-headed person. So we've seen that story to today. So it looks like there is uh, uh, that thing going on and all that. Um, you are from that camp. Uh, a few days on, what's, what's the what's the feeling like in your camp? He's not from that camp. He's actually a member of the campaign. Yeah, so that's what I mean. I mean by he's from the camp. Uh -huh. I, I, about, I, I yeah. thought you were devaluing his position. He's a very oh, important. Person. I'm sorry. Apologies. Very, very important. Apologies, sir. There's, there's I'm sorry. No I'm sorry. Please pardon me. Yeah. Please pardon me. Well, pardon I mean, me. I think that, um, mm. like you rightly um, chronicled, there's a process that um, any flag bearer would have to go through, per even our constitution. Some of it are constitutional. Some of it. Uh, what you call by convention, where you would have to do your consultations and then get the buy-in of certain key personalities and if you like organized groups, then you go to the constitutional aspect of it. And so, for example, you mentioned the, the, the president, you mentioned the, the majority caucus in parliament, but there are also a stream of other people and even organized groups that you probably haven't mentioned that would have to be consulted as well. Now, constitutionally, you have to go to NEC, and then NEC would also, once NEC agrees, you now go to uh, the National Council, which is basically the body clothed with the power to actually accept or not of the choice that you have made. And I'm sure that these processes have been respected, it's been adhered to. But you know, we are in a uh, political uh, enterprise. So sometimes some of these conversations and these meetings will definitely come to the public domain. But for a political party that prides itself in making sure that we stick to the constitution that we, we are governed by, uh, the processes has to be um, respected, and you have to basically 
make sure that you go through all these processes before you can do a formal announcement of a running mate. But from where I sit, uh, by and large, um, the, the choice that the flag bearer has made has been widely accepted by the rank and file of the party. And this key, if, I, if you like, uh, protagonist and organized um, groups within the party. And so for us, we're just waiting for tomorrow to come for uh, the NEC meeting and also the National Council meeting. I'm sure that you're very close to uh, where the action would actually happen. Mm -hmm. So um, you would definitely get the official announcement and then we will proceed from, what went, from there. What went into uh, the choice of uh, Dr. Foku Prempe? That question would have to go to the flag bearer. But if you want me to... He hasn't, he hasn't <laughs> briefed you guys. No, but that's what I'm saying. That, I mean, when you, there's a lot of things that would um, be considered. But apart from all the things in terms of competence, in terms of uh, a right fit and all of that, um, a vice president's role has to be a one, it has to be one that you, has to go to somebody that you can trust somebody that you have a, re a relationship with, somebody that understands your language. When I say your language, not necessarily what we speak, but how you relate to people, your vision, and is able to complement who you are as a president. So every president is as good as, if you like, the, the vice president that they have. And I'm sure that that is some of the reasons and the considerations that have gone into the, uh, the nomination. But, you mm. know, I think that we also have to be very clear in our minds that the, the process, of course, sometimes will be very, if you like, um, tensed. Because in our party, I'm sure that if you want to find two, three, four, five hundred people who would be uh, running mates, you can find them. But the reality is that the decision is a sole preserve of that of the flag bearer. And once the decision is made, then everybody has to rally behind that particular decision. And then we'll go out there and prosecute a campaign. And I believe that if we're talking about the attributes of the, uh, the nominee, you realize that, I mean, when it comes to public service, when it comes to competence, when it comes to his own charisma and relationship with the people, uh, is there. And then we can be able to make references to, to that. So for me, um, if you ask me, we're very excited. We are happy that um, gradually the process is coming to a certain conclusion. Because sometimes some of these little asides, if you want to put it that way, uh, sometimes distracts from the clear vision that we should be having and the focus on going out there, telling our side of the story and prosecuting uh, a campaign for 2024. Right. Rosie? Well, the first comment I'd like to make is that at a certain point in Napo's political career, he used to sit on Good Morning Ghana like you are sitting. He used to be my partner in the early morning debates and so on. And his elevation to the position of vice presidential candidate perhaps spells hope for people like Eric <laughs> that it is just possible that at some future date, people like you would also emerge as very prominent leaders of your party. And to that extent, I cannot be sad that Napo has been chosen. But you see, Randy, I'm learning for the first time that the meeting at which His Excellency President Danado Dankwa Kufuado was informed of the choice was by Zoom. Wow. Yeah, he was out of the country. And, and he could not be brief before he left the country. He could not <coughs> be moved after his return. It had to be by Zoom. Maybe that was the formal meeting. Yeah, but then there must be compelling reasons why such an important meeting is conducted by Zoom, you understand? And I don't know why, but I'd like to find out a lot more detail about how such an important meeting of informing His Excellency the President 
about Dr. Baumia's choice was done by Zoom. That's why. Now, I've been told, and Eric, please correct me if I'm wrong, that the Baumia campaign did not release a statement about this meeting. Did yes. not put this, this information in the public domain. Yes. I'm also aware of the fact that the Jubilee House, the Flagstaff House, did not issue a statement on this matter. And yet, I mean, the following day or two, this matter was on all the front pages. And in fact, many of the reports in the different newspapers were identical. So it does suggest to me that somebody deliberately put out this information. Now, what was the motive? Whoever put out this information, did he have the authority of the presidential candidate's campaign? Did he have the authority of the president himself? And so on. But you see, Randy, I read those reports very carefully. And I suspect that there was some mischief involved in that report. Even graphic, daily graphic, mm -hmm. reported that when the president was informed, hmm, he spoke his mind. And, and that is repeated in many of the reports, that the president spoke his mind and eventually accepted the nomination. Unless my English teacher was so horrible. So from this reading of what was put out, it does appear that there was some hesitation on the part of the president. He didn't readily accept the nomination. He spoke his mind and eventually came to accept the nomination. That is the language which is used in the report. And it makes me a bit, you know, queasy, you know, queasy. What, what really happened? When the president spoke his mind, what did he speak to? And how did he eventually eventually, the operative word there is eventually, how did he eventually come to accept the nomination? Now, be that as it may, we were also told that all the major stakeholders had been consulted at the time that the announcement was made. Okay. That is also being contested now. And I've read the statement made by the Honorable, what is his name? Apia Kubi. Kubi. You understand? I've read the statement he made. I've actually listened to him directly and so on. And one of the things he says is that the parliamentary caucus had not been consulted at the time the announcement was made. <coughs> it's pretty but, obvious. But it's, it's it's announcement was made. It's, it's the announcement was made. By who? You would know. Why no, are you but, but, you but, no, no, no announcement was made. There were news reportage. Who put that? that, that in but the that news? we can't. But I mean, Brandy is here. He's, a, he's, a, he's like a, a renowned media person. Mm -hmm. These things get out. You know what they I'm saying? They didn't just get no, out. No, but what I mean is that you know, Eric, it wasn't. There was no official announcement from anybody. But there was this an announcement by who? You should know. I wasn't at that meeting. Exactly. I couldn't tell you. Yeah, no, but uh, <laughs> it must be somebody who was privy to the Unimpeachable meeting. sources. Yes. <laughs> but you see, for me, the key thing is that at least three newspapers use the same words <coughs> to describe what had happened, which would suggest that there was a syndication. That's correct. Which would suggest that there was a syndication. Now, whoever masterminded that syndication must have been privy to the meeting, must have known what happened in the meeting. And whoever released that statement uh, clearly wanted to do some mischief. This line about the president spoke his mind and eventually came to accept the nomination. It's not very positive, is it? It shows that the president had misgivings about the candidate. Okay, so whoever did that had a motive. Whoever did that was subversive of the process. Huh? Whoever did that aimed at angering people like Honorable Andy Apiakubi. 
whose main point was that there could not have been wide consultations when the parliamentary caucus had not been consulted. You know. And then he goes on to make another very interesting point. He says, look, he's a parliamentary candidate. And he cannot see how hmm, the vice presidential candidate nominated can come to his constituency and lift his hand. Why? He is the one who would know, Randy. The suggestion is that there is some very bad blood between him and the presidential candidate. And indeed, he also gave the impression that he was not just speaking for himself, but he was speaking for other parliamentary candidates. Now, that is interesting, given the fact that uh, Napo himself mm -hmm. is a member of the majority caucus in parliament. So if the indication is that there are some members of the majority caucus who are so unhappy with him, what did he do to them? How did he so unruffle them as to make them come out and publicly denounce his selection? That's a matter that you and I may not know. Okay? We may not know, never know. So Now, there are also some things which are exceedingly worrying. I mean, yesterday... We saw photographs of the candidate, His Excellency Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, Napo himself, and my good friend Wuntu. And the story is that the president, the presidential candidate, has solved their differences and brought them together. What is happening here? First and foremost, one of the reasons why supporters of Napo have been most strident uh, in pushing him forward. It's their claim, which I don't support anyway, that Napo comes from the Ashanti region. He's an Ashanti royal and is likely to mobilize Ashanti behind the presidential candidate chair of His Excellency Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. Now, now, from what Andy Apia Kubi is, is saying, it does give the impression that Ashanti is not united behind him. From the picture and story which was carried by most newspapers yesterday about the presidential candidate patching differences between the regional chairperson, not an ordinary person, and Napo. So how then can we sustain the assumption that is the candidate to rally Ashanti behind the presidential candidate. I don't know. Okay. Now, there are other statements which are also worthy of note, and one which Randy just referred to. And I think that's most important. Statements about the... Just the, 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 the general... How do I say it? I'm lost for words. I wish you could help me. You know. But... About, about his candor, about his public relations, and so on. You, you mean Napu? Of course. Okay. I mean, statement. I mean, if you listen to Che Mensah Bonsu's comments about the, pre the presidential candidate having to choose somebody whose words are weighted before they are altered, and so on, it does create a certain impression. Okay. What he said was that. Uh, the presidential candidate does not need an arrogant and hot-headed person. Yeah, exactly what I'm trying to say. You know, and I was, I was lost for words, for appropriate words. So, Randy, thank you very much for helping me out. You know. But then, that's an issue. Because, look, we have five months to an election. And one statement from a running mate can come completely wreck the campaign. Just one statement. Can completely wreck the campaign. Now, since news of this apparent nomination came up, I've seen what is being done on social media, and I have a very strong suspicion that what is being done on social media is mainly instigated or done by NDC propaganda. But it's still important. What is happening? 
They've gone back five, six years and reproduced videos of the nominee and the things he has said, and they are pasting them all over the place. And some of those videos are worrying. I mean, for example, there's a video of him saying that if government earmarked funds for the construction of the Kitasi defense project, it will mobilize Ashantis to go and protest. Wow. That is something out of this world. And there are many other videos. You know, I don't want to repeat all the things which is heard in those videos saying. Of course, there's the most recent one about Doomso and so on. So this raises substantial questions. Now, the other issue which, which Eric raised, and I fully agree with Eric, has to do with how compatible the running mate is with the presidential candidate. And if for nothing at all, we can always refer to the relationship that existed between Mr. Jerry John Rollins and his vice president, called Nkensen Naka. And that is why the choice to a very large extent ought to be the choice of the presidential candidate. He has to decide who he's comfortable with. He has to decide who he's likely to work with in, 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 in a smooth, you know, administration and so on. Otherwise, you are likely to have some of these things which have happened in the past. Do your care. You understand? So that's very important. To that extent, I would insist that to the extent that it is possible, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia should be given some kind of a free hand to choose his running mate. If it doesn't work, it will be upon his own head. If it works, perhaps Ghana will become the beneficiary. Are you, are you suggesting that this choice is not his choice? Well, I am speaking very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. You understand? Because I know that there have been all kinds of influences. I know, for example, that uh, my sister, I think your real cousin, mm -hmm. Natoshi, mm -hmm. had a lot of support from the women's lobby and also from the clergy, the Christian clergy, and so on. And all of them mounted substantial pressure on the vice president. Okay. I also do know of the Minister for Education, who I think is a very nice gentleman. I've had to deal with him on a couple of occasions. Um, I was amazed at his general honesty, you know, admits when there are problems, makes concessions when he has to make, and so on. He was also highly canvassed for. And again, I had the privilege of interviewing him on, on, on talk time, okay? And I asked him directly if, if he would accept the position. And from the answer he gave, it was obvious mm -hmm. that he would embrace the position, not just with both arms, but also with his legs. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I got that impression. There were many others, like the chief of staff, you know, and the canvassing for the chief of staff actually went beyond a certain limit. I mean, I was really fascinated when I saw the song which had been composed. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was really fascinated by that. What? They composed a song. And in the, in the, in the video, accompanying the song in the video, yes. his, her dancing was, wow, excellent. I didn't know she was such a good dancer. I mean, wriggling her waist to the floor and, and, and so on. I mean, it was really amazing. And, and many others. Okay, so the presidential candidate has come under considerable um, influence. There are many people who try to lobby him and so on. And I want to hope that this decision is his own decision. Again, I think it is important to mention that the New Patriotic Party has a certain tradition and that the party has been able in the past to resist 
at least one nomination of a presidential candidate. That I know. Okay. And that even before the matter went to the National Council for approval, pressure has been brought on a presidential candidate to drop the person that he would have wanted to nominate. Okay. So I do know that. The MPP is not a rubber stamp. Are you referring to the woman nominee? Yes. Okay. Yes. The MPP has not been a rubber stamp when it comes to these nominees and so on. Um, <clears throat> right now, the impression I'm getting, and it's only an impression because I don't know enough, the impression I'm getting is that Napo would end up being endorsed. And I get that impression, one, from a conversation that I've had, with the national organizer of the party, uh, Nanabi, mm, who is so passionately in support of Napo. Mm -hmm. Very, very passionate. I mean, you can tell that he will do every and anything to make Napo's candidature become a reality. And the passion with which he spoke and so on. And of course, you cannot forget the fact that he has been a backer of His Excellency Dr. Baumia from the very beginning. He was one of those who backed him very strongly. And his voice must mean something. And his voice is clearly for, 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 for Napo, you understand. I've spoken to other members, prominent, of the, prominent members of the party, who appear to be keenly supporting Napo. What worried me was the reasons for supporting Napo. The reasons he gave you. They gave me. Okay. They gave me. Uh, and the reason is that he's in a fighting mood. He wants to fight. He's dying for a fight and so on. Now, if he takes statements he's made in the past and so on, if he's in a mood, that mood to fight as is being described by party stalwarts and so on, I worry. What is he going to say again? I will really worry about what he's going to say again. You know. But... Randy, as I said from the very beginning, we all, all of us, we can only wish our friend Dr. Matthew Opoku Prempe the best. He's a friend of ours, okay? Even though ultimately the interest of Ghana must be supreme and must guide what we say and so on, you cannot also ignore the relationship that we came to build you know, together, and so on. So we can wish him well. That is not to say that people should go and vote for him, but generally to wish him well in his aspirations to become vice president of the Republic of Ghana. Mm. Perhaps the only thing that I can add is that the national situation is, is, is horrible. And all those seeking power must be minded by the state of the nation because the tax ahead will be huge. Mm. The tax ahead will be humongous. Mm. The tax ahead is not easy at all. And those clamoring to be presidential candidates and running mates and so on ought to keep that at the back of their heads. Mm. Yeah. Well, just a, a, a couple of quick yes. points. Uh, so the first thing is about uh, being a member of a, a political party. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the, 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 the kind of people that make up a, poli and I mean a political party, people from divergent places with views and opinions and all sorts of um, experiences. And so it can never be that you'll be a member of a political party and you will not rub off people the wrong way um, at a certain point in time or people won't even have um, a certain if like dislike or would even express some kind of disquiet. In this, interest, in, in this uh, enterprise as well, you also know the fact that people just have preferences. People have people that they know. There are people that you went to school with. There are people that uh, go to the same church as you go. You go to the same mosque that you go to. There are people that have, have family relationships. They, you know, so sometimes for me, I mean, my orientation really is that you will never, ever be able to make a choice that will be uh, overwhelmingly or be anonymously approved by everybody. But in the spirit of how a political party is run, 
once a decision is made, a decision has been made. And everybody who is a bona fide member of that particular uh, political party has to abide by those decisions. You, you understand what I'm saying? So you could choose anybody. You could, you could choose anybody. And there will still be people who would have some reservations about that particular choice. But my little experience, even in this game, is that there are people who, for example, there are people who oppose the nomination of the current flag bearer who are now key members of his campaign. Right? You, you know what I'm saying? And so for me, I, I look at it from a certain orientation that once these things are done, uh, people would now understand the real reasons why it's been done and then we'll rally behind the, the flag bearer's choice mm -hmm. and then we'll move on and prosecute uh, a campaign. Okay. But uh, just one more issue mm -hmm. and I think that issue came to a head yesterday when there were rumours of the resignation of Mr. Dan Botry as chairman of the campaign team. Now I'm surprised that as of today that has not been confirmed or denied. Is there some truth in it? Because if there is some truth in it, that would be a danger signal. But Eric is here. Let's ask him. Yeah, but that's why I'm raising the issue. And so let him answer before yeah. he proceeds. No, but let me lay the grounds. Okay. You know. I thought you would, you would be better off hearing his answer. Oh, okay. Uh, I agree with you. Randy. Because he said it's not been confirmed or denied. Yes. So please, can, can you confirm or deny it for us? There's no resignation. I mean, you see, I, I think that sometimes... What I read... We, we, uh, and yeah, Eric, yeah. Just, mm -hmm. What I read was that he has not attended any of the meetings and that there was even a meeting uh, recently. He didn't attend that as well. And that he's not um, too happy with how the campaign... Is being run. He's been talked to to at least attend Thursday's meeting and to come back and be part of the process. Can you confirm or deny this first? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. But all, all I can say but, is. But I'll be, I'll be surprised see? if anybody has reached him. Because yesterday mm. I had the distinguished privilege mm. of being on the same program with Nana Akumia, who happens to be his deputy. Yeah, he's a vice chair. Yes, yes, and one of his deputies. Yes, there are two vice chairs. And Nana Akumia actually indicated on air that over the last three days, he's been trying to reach him and he's not responding to his calls. He confirmed that on... He on said PCF, that. On yeah. Bami Show. Yes, he said that yesterday. That we've been trying to reach him for three days and cannot reach him. But then when the phone rings, the ringtone he gets, appears to suggest that he's out, out of the, of the country. country. Okay. That's what he said yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not... But did he, did he confirm or deny the issue about uh, Mr. Boche not being happy and not attending the meetings? No, no, he didn't know. He, didn't he had know. no information that he had resigned. Okay. Indeed, he said that you'd be very surprised if the rumor turns out to be true. Mm. Okay. Right. So, I mean, I, I think that's... All right. I can move okay. On. Oh. Because is that all you are going to say? Yes, he, he defers to Nana Kumar's position. We can move on. So you can move on now. Well, uh, the, what I wanted to say was that mm. if you guys lose the Mbotri, you would have lost a valuable asset. You understand? If it's true that the Mbotri is unhappy, if it's true that he has resigned or is considering resignation, then you have a lot of work to do. Because one of the very few people you have in the campaign whose credibility is intact, and who has demonstrated over the years that, 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 that he's honest, he talks very frankly, and, and so on. And in the MPP circles, he's also known as an astute organizer. Please don't lose him for your own sake. Mm. All right, OK. Well, it's time to uh, take a break before we lose some money. Right, welcome back to the show. If you just joined us, this is Good Morning Ghana Live on Metro TV. Still with me on the show, of course, Pratt Jr. and Eric Amwakuchum, Ayesuko, the Kosovo Dambi Big, 
But Bedway's cash will be bigger. Bedway is giving you more control of every thrilling bet you place. Enjoy the biggest and most reliable cash out in Ghana on Betway without any hassle. Sign up today at betway.com.gh. Terms and conditions apply. It's not for persons under 18 and is regulated by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Betway, get way more. And Blue Jeans Energy Drink has been on the Ghanaian market for over 20 years. We already know what it does for the body. It contains vitamins and nutrients like vitamin B2, B3, B6, B12, as well as taurine and guarana, which are known to boost your strength and energy, as well as promote high performance and endurance. Blue Jeans Energy Drink has been tested and tried. It's indeed the best. Blue Jeans Energy Drink is for bold and active men and women. So go on, grab a cold can and power your day. It's in shops nationwide. You can reach Budget Cash and Carry Limited on 0208-128190 or 055-001-0000. Okay. Um, now, the issues of... I'd wanted to play you um, two, two videos. Um, one has to do with the majority leader. Um, on the free SHS bill and the response by the minority um, leader because the majority leader spoke and granted interviews and created the impression that the NDC minority um, was not in support of a bill on free SHS. The minority leader responded and that's where we found out that indeed there was even nothing before Parliament, for anybody to even uh, support or not support. Subsequent to that, we have seen a news item that suggests that this free SHS bill um, was going to cabinet, and that indeed it was not just about uh, <coughs> legislating free SHS, but it also had to do with um, changing the structure. Um, to make it a six-year a six-year program, so JHS and SHS put together and all that. That's what we have been told. We are here to see the the documents. But um, <coughs> educationist Professor Stephen Adair has voiced concerns over the practical implementation of the government's flagship free SHS program, rather than its legislative backing. The former GIMPA rector expressed confusion over government's decision to seek legislation now after seven years of practice. He noted, quote, what they've done for the past several years has not been illegal. It's been by government policy and it's acceptable. And um, his comment follows Education Minister Dr. Yaduchum's announcement that the Free SHS Bill 2024 be presented to Cabinet for debate this week. And the proposal, the proposed bill, sorry, aims to give legal backing to free and compulsory senior high school education along with several other changes to education system, including the restructuring of junior high school and the cancellation of BEC as a prerequisite for SHS admission. Dr. Edichum added that another proposal of the bill was a cancellation of the BEC, rather it will be used for school selection purposes. When passed, the certification for completing SHS will become the first level of formal certificate any student could obtain in a country rather than the BEC certification. Education Minister further stated, what we need is a law that says there should be free compulsory universal secondary education. <coughs> this means the minimum education for the Ghanaian should be a senior high school and not junior high school. It's our responsibility to provide the support for them. Despite his proposed changes, Professor Adair remains skeptical. He argues that the policy is sound, but the focus should be on refining its implementation rather than legislating it. There must be a reason why they want to bring in a law now. He said, question the necessity of the proposed legislation, and he suggests that the education ministry should consult with experts, stakeholders, and ordinary Ghanaians to improve the policy. I've been in public service all my life until retirement, and this is a very weird way of doing policy. He added, emphasizing the need for practical solutions over legal um, um, formalities. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so, so. Crazy, he raises a key issue. He says that um, the education ministry should consult with experts, stakeholders, and ordinary Ghanaians to improve the policy. I've heard other people also raise the issue that why go to cabinet for cabinet approval? You know, initially the impression that was created was that oh, it was just to legislate a free SHS. 
because of that, if there's a change in government, um, it will be discontinued. So let's legislate it to prevent any uh, the future government from, 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 from stopping it and all that. But what the education minister has disclosed to us now is not about that. It is about completely changing the structure of Ghana's education. And as Prof um, raises, we have not seen any stakeholder um, consultation. This is education. And what we are being told is that it is going to cabinet for a debate and a decision. Uh, I don't know what you make of what's going on. Well, to be honest with you, I mean, the most skating criticism of this free is HSS program has come from somebody that I respect a lot, who himself is an academic, who himself is involved in education, and who himself is a lawyer of huge repute. And that is Professor Akila Pasoya. And I'm sure that both of you have seen his comments on the free SHS you know, program. Indeed, Professor Akila Pasoya has said that the conception of the program and its implementation is, to quote his words, unintelligent. That's what Professor Akila Kwasora says, unintelligent. Now, he says that he's a Marxist and therefore has a certain commitment to compulsory free basic education. He has that commitment, you know. But that in implementing it, you've got to find out, you know, how that would impact on all sectors of the national life. You don't just put money in free SHS and so on, you need to determine have an issue, the impact of policy on other areas of the national life and so on. And then he raised a question which is most important, Randy. He says, look, me, being vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, mm -hmm. I'm a lawyer and so on, I can afford to pay the school fees of my children. How does it feel if you exempt people like me from paying school fees when in the rural areas, in the remote corners of this country, there are children who, has no, who have no access to electricity, who are schooling under trees, who can't even have decks and so on, you know, to, 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 to write on. Okay. Now, the second person who has spoken so very eloquently, I don't normally admire him all the time, but on this issue, I think he's been quite eloquent, is Professor Adai. And his comments have been stated by Randy, so I need not repeat them. He's also spoken. Now, there's a third person, and that third person is most interesting. The <coughs> current vice president, who is also the presidential candidate of the New Patriotic Party, had made the comment that you don't need legislature to implement the SHS program. That's most instructive. Dr. Baumia says that you don't need legislature to be able to implement the SHS program. And in fact, that is in sync with what Professor Adai is saying. Okay. Now, are we now being told that for seven years, the NPP administration illegally implemented the free SHS program. Was there a legal bar? Was there a legal restriction? There was none. So I'm so surprised that, that this legislation, we are making you know, so much noise about this legislation. Unless we admit, or unless we say that over the last seven years, it has been illegally implemented. If it has been legally implemented, why the rush? Then, Randy, there's an issue about the hierarchy of laws. Okay? The hierarchy of laws. And there's no doubt whatsoever that if you come to consider the hierarchy of laws, mm, the 1992 Constitution is the supreme law of Ghana. Now, if the 1992 Constitution insists that we must make education free. 
how can you entrench anything about free education by going for, you know, lesser laws and so on? Your laws passed in Parliament hmm, must be consistent with the 1992 Constitution before they can have any validity. Okay. So you have the Constitution itself making provisions for, for free education and so on. Why the need to go to Parliament for inferior legislation, you know, and so on? I, 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 I don't know. Now, there's something very interesting, and it is what I've noticed, that this whole move is more propagandist than, 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 <coughs> than administrative or legal. It's more propagandist. And I've come to this conclusion based on the statements which were made by the majority leader, uh, Honorable Afeno Makin. When Afeno Makin actually came out and said that the minority, the so-called minority, was opposed to the bill, when the bill had not even been drafted, when even cabinet had not received the bill. And how do you oppose something which doesn't exist? That's a problem. Now, from the snipers we are getting, it does appear that the bill which has gone to cabinet for discussion and approval is which going to make... Which is on its way to cabinet, we are told. It's not landed there yet. How long does it take to move from Minister of Education to, to Jubilee House? Well, well let's say it's on its way. It depends way on who's carrying it. Maybe a snail. Yeah. Maybe it's on the back of a snail, you know. But whatever it is... That bill from the snipers we are getting is making substantial changes, massive substantial changes to senior high schools as they exist today. In fact, the entire education sector. Yeah. Because you know you refer to the constitution yeah. dealing with hierarchy of laws and yeah. all that, okay? Yeah. So I was even going to raise a small issue. Yeah. And you see, when you look at the constitution, the constitution speaks about basic education speaks about secondary education and speaks about tertiary education. Mm -hmm. Now, you realize that basic education, which is F cube, is where the constitution actually gives a timeline, 15 years, yeah. from the promulgation of the constitution, yeah. which presupposes that by, 20, by 2007, we should have free compulsory basic education. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to secondary and tertiary, it doesn't give a timeline, unlike basic where it says... Because progressively. Yes, unlike basic where it says 15 years. Mm -hmm. So initially, my suspicion initially was that um, maybe whoever is thinking of a legislation is looking at perhaps putting that thing there, that, that specific timeline there or something, mm -hmm. something to that effect. Uh -huh. So that was just it, mm -hmm. which means that the issue of secondary and tertiary, no, no, there's no, there, there, there are no timelines mm -hmm. for those ones. Uh -huh. But when you speak about hierarchy of laws, then you would realize that the constitution itself now um, has education in three segments. So what it describes as basic education, secondary education, and tertiary education. What this bill, from what the sec, uh, minister has told us, what this bill seeks to do is to now change that structure. Mm -hmm. And so when they say secondary education, what it means is that a three-year of GHS, which is known as basic or part of basic education, is going to be added to secondary education. So you have a complete yeah. overhaul of what the structure is. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that is true. But you see, Randy, the, not the MPP, I mean, some of the communicators of the MPP, mm. or better still, the propagandists of the MPP, mm. I've been on this binge for a long time. Which one? Claiming that review of SHS, of free SHS, amounts to abandoning it. You understand? They've been running with it over a long period of time. It is not clear from what we are hearing about what has gone to cabinet that there's a major review underway by the Akufuado government itself. But even before... What Major has, review. Even before what hasn't gone there. In yeah. the IMF document. But I was coming uh -huh. to that. Okay. So the MPP itself is carrying out a major review of the free SHS policy. Now, if you look at the agreement they have reached with the IMF, mm. 
which is being touted by all kinds of propagandists and, and so on. That agreement itself acknowledges the need for review. So how come that they've come to the conclusion that review means abandonment and so on? Well, where is that coming from? When they themselves have committed to review, when they are engaged in a process of review, and another very important point is that these reviews are taking place without stakeholder consultations. No stakeholder consultations at all. Okay? The teachers' organizations, <coughs> where are they in this review, this massive review that is being carried out by, by this government? Look, I think that education is a key pillar of the national I'm extremely effort. surprised because even the, the increase of the SHS from three years to four years, we saw the stakeholder engagements yeah. before the legislative um, um, stuff and all that, the documentation and all those things. We saw it. Mm -hmm. I would be surprised that we intend to have such far-reaching, you know, structural changes in our education. And our recourse is to go to cabinet for a debate. You rush it to parliament. I, it's, it's, it's I, I find weird. it extremely weird. strange. Yeah. Yeah. Strange is, is, is a kind word. It's weird. Extremely weird. You understand? Weird. But, you know, I mean, for me, Education is one of the key pillars of the national development effort anywhere in the world. And I think it is a crime to reduce it to a propaganda tool. It's a crime to reduce discussions on education to pranks intended to win votes in an election. I, I think it's clearly unacceptable. And you want to play chaskele with our education? Our education is reduced to just some tool of making some contestants in the election unpopular. And so on. Is, is that the purpose? I'm worried, you know, that this appears to be the attitude. Why? I would have thought that if we want a sustainable free SHS program, in putting forward reforms and so on, we would engage all stakeholders. And my definition of all stakeholders would include political parties in the opposition. Because as for this legislation, eh? Masa, you can pass the legislation today. Tomorrow morning, if there's another government, they can throw the legislation away. Easy. So passing the legislation is not a guarantee for the continuation of the free I mean, the most important thing program. is the buying. You yeah. know, and, and... No, I, I will be... Chrissy, I'll be extremely surprised because I do not know of any major, you know, um, educational move that has not, you know, been, been, been done on the basis of uh, stakeholder engagement. Yes, not everybody, not everybody will agree to what you want to do. But that's how it's done, especially when... You want to change the structure. You know, the first time in recent days in the Fourth Republic, this thing has come up in the manifesto of some parties. The issue of making SHS the termination point. And, and so people, so I've heard um, um, the CPP, I've heard uh, Dr. Indrum in the past. I think that in the NPP's 2016 manifesto, if I, I stand to be corrected, there was also something like that, you know. And all these things have been canvassed. The person who made a, really a lot of noise about this in the Fourth Republic was Dr. Indo, about making SHS a termination point and not doing BC and all those things. Actually, he came with that policy from the Convention People's Party. You know, he had been flagged by yes, the Convention yes, People's yes. Party. So that's the where The Convention he first People's Party it. was the first political right. party to advocate free education. Okay. So Indom came from the Convention People's Party okay. with that. Yeah. But interestingly, Dr. Indom's party was the first political party 
which actually did a costing yeah. of the program yeah. and came out with its implications on other sectors of the national life and so on. Nobody it did a very thorough job. Nobody, not even the NPP, which eventually came to implement it, did that thorough job. Uh, Eric, let me hear you. Really, I mean, um, so I, I feel that sometimes when it comes to this kind of uh, discussions, uh, we should sort of eschew intellectual arrogance. There are people who are the Ministry of Education, who are GES, who are part of the whole educational setup, who are also today implementing these policies, right? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes to hear things like unintelligent and all of those things, for me, should not be the way to have a discourse of this nature in terms of a national, uh, of, of these national proportions. You can disagree. Like any policy, you can always have disagreement. You can even be disagreeing based on a certain ideological standpoint. What's your problem with that? I have yeah, a problem with yes. that because, you see, if you're not careful, you would go back into these conversations and then you would actually trivialize this conversation. At the moment, as we speak, we have a system where Let's assume that a child goes into GSS at 10, 11, 12. By the time they finish GSS, they are like 14 years old or something like that. You leave GSS with what? A, a GSS certificate. And at 14, you don't even qualify to even gain any meaningful employment. In today's day, you can't do anything with a GSS certificate apart from being able to use it as a placement, a means to placement to go to an SHS. And so at the time that this thing was being implemented and our kids were truncating JSS at 13, 14, and 15, was that an intelligent policy? You see, so sometimes. What are you responding no, I'm to? No, I'm responding, responding to the very old. Yeah, I'm, 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 no, I'm, but you are wrong. No, I'm not wrong. I'm just. No, I'm, let me I'm, tell you why no, you are wrong. I'm, I'm not mentioning anybody's. No, I'm but let me, let me tell you why you are wrong. When it comes to policy implementation. No, just hold on. Let me tell you why you are wrong. The, the, we refer to Professor Akila But I haven't referred yeah, to No, him. hold on. Yeah. We, we can't pretend <laughs> on this show. Yeah, yeah, we refer to Professor Akila Kbasoya and refer to. What Professor Akil Akbasoya referred to as unintelligent. Mm -hmm. And he was specific mm -hmm. that when it comes to the implementation of the free SHS, yes. there are people who can pay. What he said was that if you don't do a mean testing, mm -hmm. yes, you don't engage in mean testing, and you do this wholesale general thing, mm -hmm. it is unintelligent. That's what he said. Okay. He didn't talk about no, an issue of I, a, a policy to change this or change no, that. No, but, he but, was clear. But Randy, I have sat here on several occasions and said that people who have called for means testing are actually they are within, well within their right to do so because it happens in other jurisdictions. Even the media pass finance minister. Is that was, Yes, who was actually a key... He said it didn't make sense. Yes. It was senseless. In terms of uh, the management of this process. Yeah. Also uh, preferred... He said it was senseless. A, 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 a if he can afford to pay for five people, a, a why should it be free? A, a, a divergent yeah. view, right? A lot of arguments have been pushed and presented in terms of why it makes sense. You see, in all of this conversation, it's also about the people who are impacted a lot more. You know, you have people who were truncating their education yeah. at the point where they just couldn't even fathom an idea of going to secondary school. Because once you leave JSS, or even in times past, it used to be called a middle school living certificate or common entrance, the first thing that the family will say that go and learn a trade or go and find something else to do because they do not have any uh, means to do so. Then you have families that can actually afford to pay but all that is left is absolutely nothing because they have absolutely nothing left. They are actually using all their resources and uh, well, whatever to pay for their kids to go to school. And so for me, I think that, yes, we can come back and have these conversations about mistesting and all of those. I don't have a problem with that. In the general conversation around education, whereby the position is that, 
How do you allow a child who is 13, 14 to truncate the education at a certain point? Let's extend the, or let's redefine what the basic education means so that at least, for, if for nothing at all, that child is leaving school with an SHS uh, certificate and they'll be able to do other things. They are more matured, they've gone through it. Uh, because we went to a system where you were in secondary school for seven years, mm -hmm. from form one to upper six. Mm -hmm. You know what so I'm saying? And so for me, I think that it's probably nothing that is extraordinary. It's not an original idea. It's about, like you said, even if there's a conversation about consultations and stakeholder consultations and everything, there are all sort of like practical things Eric, that need to be done. Are you aware? But are you aware? You know Let me just ask yeah, you this yeah. question. Are you aware that despite the fact that F cube mm -hmm. is law, mm -hmm. And that from 27, 2007, yeah. per the constitutional, um, um, uh, the constitutional provision, FQ has become law. Mm -hmm. So we have free compulsory basic education, at least from 2007 till date. And that the termination point is JHS 3. Mm -hmm. Are you aware that there are many students for who termination is class six. Yes. And it's as a result, mm -hmm. not because there is no law. The current law terminates, the first termination point is JHS 3. Mm -hmm. But by virtue of the fact that there are many schools mm -hmm. that do not have JHS. Yes, yes, yes. They have only class one to class six. six yes. So many of these students, and if you read the reports from Edu Watch and others, you will see it. Many of these kids, when they finish the class six, they have to go miles to, to be uh, able to assess even GSS-1. GSS yeah. So for them, although there's a law that says that the first termination point is JHS-3, they are unable to terminate there. Mm -hmm. No, but Randy, I, I agree with you. And I think that, I mean, one of the things that we are doing is that we are trying to probably, uh, if we like, christen this proposed bill or this intention of a new bill as a free SHS bill. <laughs> right, but the reality is that it's not supposed to be. It's not. No, but who's doing be, that? No, no, but that's what I'm saying. That. No, but yeah, I'm, I'm who's saying doing that. that? I'm, what you're what complaining I'm about? What I'm it. saying yeah. is that it is not a free SHS bill. It is a redefinition of a basic education. I don't know what is going to be called. What is going to be defined as? But so again, you, you, this platform. The majority leader doesn't know what you're saying. Oh no, but I don't speak for the majority leader. We are, we are just it, it, speaking it just to, seems to me that we, we, you are we, saying something totally different from what the majority leader is pushing. No, no, no. But that's what I'm saying, that he can choose to call it whatever he wants to call it. But in terms of what actually is inside of that particular bill and how it seeks to, one, redefine basic education and at least make sure that, like I indicated, that if you, you can have a child that goes to GSS at 10 and by 13 they're done with school, what are they going to be doing with their lives? Right, if you don't have a system that actually makes sure that that child still stays within the school uh, system to be able to be able to get to a point where they have enough education to be able to now decide whatever it is that they want to do with their lives. Right, so these are things that, and then in the, the redefinition of that, having secondary schools attached to this JSS uh, uh, school so that a child is in school from from one to from six or whatever it is, or use the BEC as a basis for school selection alone, but not a point of truncation. These are conversations that we can have. My challenge, and I'm a proponent of consultation. My challenge with consultations, and even sometimes for people who call for these consultations, is that people are asking for a consultation, and they're already coming with an entrenched view or an intransigent position on the matter. You cannot consult with somebody like that. You know what I'm saying? So whilst even this thing that we are doing... Why can't you, know, you? No, because if the person is already coming from a, with a certain position, yeah, but all that I'm going to do is to inform you... All, all yeah, you people, know what I'm saying? Of my position. Everybody will come with a position. Well, exactly. Everybody who comes to the table Including has a government. position. Yes. However... Mm -hmm. Many people. I use the word entrenched. Yeah, many people. Okay, yeah, many people. You're, you're no, you like, people people could even have entrenched positions mm -hmm. on the on the basis of what they believe, what they know, what they understand. Mm -hmm. But in the face of 
superior viewpoints or compelling reasons. Mm -hmm. They are just. Mm -hmm. every, in every negotiation, people go with set, especially when it's even institutional representation, mm -hmm. they go with set positions. Mm -hmm. Now it's up to you to let people see reason. It's up to you to critique all viewpoints there. Mm -hmm. And to find a way of, like I said, you won't get 100%. <coughs> you shouldn't even be looking for 100% uh, acceptance by everybody. Yes, yes. But at least, for you, who sits in your office and all that and believe that, first of all, you see, the arrogance when it comes to policy formulation and implementation starts off with those who believe that they have the authority and power. They start off from the belief that I am empowered by A, B, C, D. That's where the issue of entrenched positions and others will come from. Because otherwise, if you, you are even a Ghanaian citizen, now let me not be even say a player in the education, a Ghanaian citizen, and you hear that we're thinking of, government is thinking of some serious structural changes to our education. And you don't hear any consultative process mm -hmm. with respect to mm -hmm. all key <coughs> stakeholders in the sector. And that what you hear is that, oh, uh, the thing is coming to parliament for the MPs to take a decision on it. Or oh, one side does not want to support it. And the next thing here is that oh, the minister says, oh, no, we are sending it to uh, 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 cabinet for a discussion. And then from cabinet, it will come to, 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 to parliament. How would you take it? But you see, Randy, I think that we're also missing a point. There's, there's a, the whole essence of parliament and in what it stands for represents is because all 33 million of us cannot go and sit in the chamber and make a decision. And even for the processes that these bills go through, mm -hmm. requires that the, um, is the committee, the parliamentary committees and that are responsible for um, promulgating this actually are supposed to now bring in these stakeholder groups and uh, uh, whoever is interested in this particular no, but you, bill. You, to before he actually but you have worked, no you no. have worked in the executive before yeah. you know that yeah. before you before mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. let's for example gepa yeah. before you decide to propose any legislation yes and even submit it to cabinet through your sector minister mm -hmm. you would have engaged all the players in your sector mm -hmm. and have taken their inputs and everything that is how it, your ally or whatever it is will be enriched. Exactly. Before you give it to your sector ministry for onward transmission to cabinet. I agree. Not so. I agree. Uh -huh. So you do not say that I have not done that. Mm -hmm. But because when the thing gets to parliament, mm -hmm. the parliamentarians who, uh, parliament will advertise for people to bring in memoranda. Or the committee will have the opportunity of inviting people. Mm -hmm. And so... It is okay. No, no, I'm not. Uh, That's not I, how stakeholder engagement no, no, works, that, especially even in the education I, sector. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, you see, for, for example, as we speak, right, I think that there's also a lot of speculation here. It can never be the case that no stakeholder engagement has happened. You can also advocate for a lot more engagement because maybe as we even leave this particular platform, somebody else will come out, oh, I am an expert in A, B, C, and during the process, I was consulted or people, they wanted to pick my brain on these things. These things sometimes also happen in the background. That does oh, not are come... Are you saying no, that? I'm just saying. I'm just if saying. we're having stakeholder engagements mm -hmm. on changing the structure of education and all that, mm -hmm. we won't know. We won't no, but Randy, this is not a, we are not talking, we, this is not the first time we are talking about this redefinition of yes. the basic yes. education. Yes. This has been, like you say, like, I mean, because he uh, mentioned, it's a conversation that has gone on even way before we even started this uh, uh, period, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that it's actually even in the constitution and all of those things, right? I, I, I uh, yeah, you understand? Like so the for me, I law. think that I, I think that it's not. Law. I mean, of course, I don't advise the ministry that does it, but I think that anybody that calls for more consultation has every right to do so. And if there's room for us to do so, by all means, let's go. Was it the Honorable Deputy Minister of Education? Yeah. Which one? Um, the also Reverend Tim Fojo. Uh -huh. He has sent a text. Yeah. I want to read it. Read it. Okay. In fact, he intends for me to read it. Yes. So I'm reading it. it. Says, Good morning. If dismantling barriers to access to quality education for the child of the poor is considered unintelligent by members of the elite, 
who are able to afford the most expensive education for their wards. If doubling enrollment in TVET stroke SHS from 800,000 to 1.45 million students is considered unintelligent, then I wonder what intelligent policy looks like. I'm presently in my remote village, Asin Krua, <coughs> where I visited some of the 3,200 BEC candidates preparing for their BEC next week and reflected upon the several thousands of such students who during my time at Asin Krua DAJHS some three decades ago abandoned their brilliant dreams at JHS because there was no financial means to enter SHS through TVET. I was the only person from my village that year who could narrowly escape the fangs of poverty to enter Asim Mansu SHS. Never again must we go back to the era where millions of brilliant young people were denied the chance to form part of the critical mass of the population empowered through education for meaningful national development. Good morning to my intelligent uncle, Mr. Pratt, and my intelligent friends, Dr. Randy and Eric Chum. God's blessings, Reverend Intim Fodjo, Deputy Minister for Education from Asim Krua. I think this is the most unfortunate text, exceedingly unfortunate text. And, and the arrogance of this text is baffling. You know, when it comes to education and the educational rights of, of the people of Ghana, Reverend Intim Fodjo has the, the audacity to compare himself to Professor Akila Kwasua, who for more than 60 years has been in the forefront of advocacy for educational rights, who became the youngest vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, and whose record at the university perhaps is unparalleled. And so, now you are talking about education. And you are running down comments of people like Akila Kpasoya and so on. But, uh, crazy. I what, hope you are, I hope you are not suggesting that Professor Akila Kpasoya cannot get it wrong. He can get it wrong. Yes. No, everybody can get it wrong. Mm. But you see, in evaluating his comments, mm. you ought to look at his background. It's important. No, for me, I think we're even missing the and, point. I, 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 please yes. allow me. Yes. And he hasn't said any of the things which is attributed to him by Reverend Itim for your Deputy Minister of Education. Mm -hmm. He is not opposed to free education. He endorses free education. Mm. But he's saying that it does not make sense to give free education to the most wealthy and affluent in our society mm. where the poorest are denied free education. That makes a lot of I sense. I mean, why is taxation even progressive? Exactly. But Randy, I, I think we should address ourselves yes. to the provisions of the Constitution. Okay, the fundamental law of Hmm. This is Article 25, and the title is Educational Rights. And it says, one, hmm. all persons shall have the right to equal education opportunities, equal educational opportunities and facilities, and with a view to achieving the full realization of that right. Hmm. A, basic education shall be free, compulsory, and available to all. This is what the Constitution says. Yes. Basic education shall be free, Mandatory. compulsory, and available to all. Mm -hmm. Is basic education? Yes, it is. Now? Yes. How? That's F cube. Masa, Randy. Yeah, F cube. Up to GHS3. You haven't been seeing the videos of educational institutions from the villages and so on. Oh, yeah, we have serious challenges. It doesn't satisfy this. Yeah, that's what I know I'm saying. It doesn't yeah. satisfy this. Yeah, true. B. Secondary education in its different forms, including technical and vocational education, shall be made generally available and accessible to all by every appropriate means, and in particular, by the progressive introduction of free education. C. Higher education shall be made equally accessible to all on the basis of capacity by every appropriate means and in particular by progressive introduction of free education. Mm -hmm. D. Functional literacy shall be encouraged or intensified as far as is possible. And E. The development of a system of schools 
with adequate facilities at all levels shall be actively pursued. Mm -hmm. This is what the Constitution says. Mm -hmm. Clear. The Constitution is very, very clear. And in fact, in the light of these provisions, why would anybody need another legislation to guarantee the continuation of free SHS? Why would anybody need another legislation? Anyway, okay. I guess that um, we'll have to perhaps uh, leave it here. We're, we're 20 minutes past our time. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd, we'd have to. So tomorrow's council meeting is uh, uh, at what time? 10 a.m. Yes, it's at uh, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Mm. Okay. 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 So we'll wait. We we'll we'll see. Thank uh, you. Of course, there's nothing. 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 We, we don't, don't expect, expect anything. We're not expecting anything dramatic. Yeah, nothing. I'm sure that the, the meeting should be over in six minutes. Uh, you sure? What else are, is going to be discussed? Okay. <laughs> it, should be, it should be over. It should be over in six minutes. Uh, uh, maybe it's the item thirteen that will delay. But apart from that, everything should be fine. Okay. All right. So. Um, is that right? <coughs> oh, okay. Okay, so we're going to have trends. Uh, <laughs> okay. Today is the 70th birthday of uh, a big brother of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I don't know if you know him. Niafutu. Mm -hmm. He's 70 today. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know him? Mm -hmm. And, and, and he's been very interested in this program. Niafutu is 70 today. He's a, he's, a, he's a proper, proper, proper Liverpool fan. Top, top, top notch Liverpool fan uh, traveling all around the world to watch yeah. Liverpool. You know, you know, you know yeah. Niafutu, yeah. So he's 70 we, today. We meet somewhere. Okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, I wish are we meeting there today? today? <laughs> ask him. I don't know. I'll ask him. <laughs> ask him. Uh, you know, he has a ritual. At the end of the season, he will host the, the last game of the season at his residence for, for the Liverpool supporters. So, Niafutu is 70 today. So, happy, happy 70th birthday to you, uh, Niafutu. And uh, we can um, wish you the very best, especially in the areas of health. And uh, we also um, and let's meet there today. are praying for a lot more, a lot more laurels for, for Liverpool to, to keep you excited and happy. You want to meet him? Happy, there today. Are you Happy not uh, urging him to make sure that we meet there today, <laughs> wherever there is. The uh, other is a show, man. You probably will have a party. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> or you want to be converted to Liverpool? No, the day he spoke about, the day Eric spoke about. Ah, okay. Eric knows where to find him. I know where to find him. You go and play golf with him. Yes. Okay. Uh, he's a golfer too. He loves golf. <laughs> anyway, so um, up next, GMG trends. Right, um, it's time to check out what is trending uh, mm -hmm. on social media. Uh, on uh, quite a dull Wednesday morning with Bright, uh, who will try and see if he can brighten our, our morning. Good morning, dog. Mr. Exclusive. It's not calm, It's not a calm Wednesday morning, no, dog. Really? It's not. Why? People are lying to us. Eh? People are lying. Oh, but they are lying. That's for that one there. Eh? From the day... From the day Satan dropped from heaven, we are lied to every day. But this one is serious. So remember we had a series serious. of tones in the country, from singer to uh -huh. Kumbaton to all that. Uh -huh. Now, this chef, Chef Smith, Who's who that? claimed to have cooked over 800 hours, uh -huh. you know, we were happy, hailing him and waiting for a result. And this man just came out last night, organized a press conference, uh -huh. and claimed he had been awarded a certificate by, you know, by the record. Um, um, uh, Guinness Book of Records. Now look at the video. So this is a video of him at the press conference with media houses there. Me media, not bloggers, so media houses. 
were called and they went there. Apparently, it's a lie. What is a lie? He has not been certified by the by Guinness Book, Book of Records. Ah, yes, it's it's a lie. I am I'm still I'm ah, so still hold on hold on hold on hold on hold on. So all of you, the media people, you went to Metro cover team, the team. Metro team wasn't there. We didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> it still doesn't excuse anybody. Yeah, I mean. So you all went there. Yes. And you all had your smartphones. With, Mr. with Mr. Google on your phone. Yes. And he didn't even bother to check. Can you imagine? And that, that's where the conversation is coming from. And this uh, morning, What is he holding? Uh, I see, see, see. You're using your smartphones to take uh, pictures. Yes. And nothing, nothing struck you to check. It wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> I think it's a video we performed of our, one of our, the media houses, and it's uh, it's just. So you are saying that all this was. Yes, it was lie. fake. Yeah, fake. It was a lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It lie, he, he he, I, I'm just wondering how he pulled uh, it. It's simple. They say now in this country, everybody is uh, working with the format. He was arrested last night. Uh, uh, more fraudy, fraudy more. Uh, how, do you, how do you do this? Huh? How, do, how, how do you do this? How do you do what? Uh, what, he, what he's done? Organize a press the, conference. Then Mr. You are not do it to all of you. <laughs> 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 no, but how would you, how, how do you even think that, that's if, if the facts as na narrated by you are yeah. true, why would anybody think that you can get away with this? I, I, no, how is it possible? Yes. You know, That's back in the day when we started, <laughs> there was no Mr. Google for you to, I mean, easily check some of these things. Right. But today, right at the function, mm. somebody could check. Exactly. Somebody could send a mail to the Guinness World Records. Mm -hmm. A mail. Yeah. To verify. Yeah, to verify. People can go and ask, uh, what's the name now? Meta, AI. Yeah. And it's even on WhatsApp. Even WhatsApp has it now. Yes, yes, there's a method on WhatsApp that yes. actually gives you all the information. So why would anybody yeah. think that? Ah, see, 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 see. What's mm. that? So it was, I mean, Chef Smith does not uh, hold the record. I after, mean, that's after, after the confirmation after came. After the fact. You know, we have to let them know. That, that's why we didn't so go. So you want to tell me that, <laughs> you want to tell me that that's for Metro, dear. You fact check. You fact check this. Exactly. So that's you why know. you didn't go. Exactly. You were not invited. Because oh. <laughs> <laughs> they knew you fact check. You know, so they knew if we had been invited, check. you would have been fighting with the drivers to take you there. Oh no, no, no. They, they knew you fat check. Ah, you know, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm no, just but to, I'm, to, I'm really but worried. seriously, yeah. if these facts, as you put out, are correct, why will anybody think that you can get away with this? How is that possible? It's, 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 it's just, it's just too much. How is that possible? You know, and and you know, the and who are is, the people with him? I think Somebody's in white applauding. Uh, and, he's, he's, he's team. and who's the lady too? He actually was part of the. He, he was supporting him. And she there's was somebody him in, the, in the, the white the jacket or something. His supporters. Oh. oh the hmm. media presence was huge. Oh. oh. See me, if I tell them, the media has to do. That way there. You shocked you. The media has to do. You shocked you. Oh. Ah, they, ah. Huh. they went to. They went. See the camera. It's big the kind of camera. Big camera. Big camera. All of them were All of them were there. Yeah, this oh, one, man. this one is July Fool. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting part of all this, so yesterday, it, it, it's it should have held the event on the first of April. Yes, no, but that would have been easier for us to. I mean, July Fool, pal. Oh, 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 you know, news also came out yesterday that Sakura was performing at the um, the opening games of the Olympics in Paris, which was a lie. Actually, yeah, but that, and we had media houses also reporting but it. But Sakura didn't say it. No, but he didn't say it. But then when the news broke, media also reported it without even knowing whether it's true or not. They didn't check. They also didn't check. Breaking news. Break, yes. Uh, and so I called a uh, DJ. DJ Mesa to later come out and explain it. Say, breaking right, news. So that's what you people do. <laughs> yeah, breaking news, you know. Breaking news. So yesterday, it was too much yesterday. I mean, too big. So uh, now you can't even tell the difference between... Um, the fake and... and, and, and um, <laughs> Because you used to say the bloggers were giving us the false information, but now mainstream media houses are also. But are many of this. you not even worse than bloggers? Yeah, I mean, I mean, after after this, after this, I can't even argue with you. Look, I want to see the media presence again. Show me. You want to see it? Yeah, Please show him again. Don't show, show them. Show the media. Uh, it, will, it will come. You see them. Yeah. The cameras are big cameras too. Very big. The big cameras. Yeah, they were there. 
Yeah. Let's see. But how do you print this? You see, the lady who went closer, she wants to have a close shot. Munkafra, <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh my goodness. Munkafra, the media do it. This is just too much. Yeah. Charlie, this guy be a hard guy. Yeah. I saw you be a hard guy. I saw you be a hard guy. It's just too much. And the lady is his deputy chef. Yes, deputy chef. Okay. He's cooked, he's cooked all of you. Uh, now we have me at whether the food he cooked on the day was even even uh, tasted good. Ah, and the, and did you have major media houses reporting? Oh, you can see one go on the on the ten. Lot of the media houses were there. Uh, doctor. Okay, okay, it's okay, it's okay. Ah, uh, plenty of the media houses. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Ah, uh, it's okay, okay. Mm, okay. Okay, then it's okay. Okay. Mm, then then so, it's okay. Now, let's talk about Mohamed Kudus. Uh huh. So I saw a, a, a tweet from um, Fabrizio, one of the um, the gentleman there who actually has some yeah. Who has more details about um, um, footballers transfers. and the transfers and yes. all that? He says the clause in Kudus's contract expired. has expired. Yes, the so 85 that means, yeah, million. He's free to go anywhere. Who said that? He's not free to go anywhere. No. Hey, what if they, if that, that is true, what it means is that mm -hmm. you can't trigger the clause. You know, when there is a, when there's a get out clause, uh -huh. let's, say, let's use this one as an like, example the 85 million. Okay. What it means is that if, if his club wants more than that, mm -hmm. They want more than that. You, the club intending to buy the player, uh -huh. you can trigger the 85 million. So you put a check of 85 million down. Uh -huh. And by the law, they are obliged to release the player. That's if the player wants to go. Oh, okay. So what it means is that, so what teams do is that when they buy a player, that they can put that clause, a release clause. Right. In the past, we say get out clause. A release clause. So the release clause means that if we don't want him to go, uh -huh and you don't reach an agreement with us, if you are able to pay that money, money. we are under obligation to release the player. But now that the, 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 the that said amount of money... Yes, so, has, so, there's no, so there's no release clause. So in this case, even if they say they want the $100 million for him, and they say you don't have the $100 million, there's no clause for you to trigger. Oh, right. Yes. Right. So you see that the teams, when they buy players, especially players who are promising or they spend a lot, they put a release clause because next year, somebody, some other team can come and oh, the yeah. player will say that, I want to go, I want to go. But would you want to see him leave uh, most time? Uh, that's his decision. Uh, for me, it is not about leaving, it's about where he's going to. Okay, because you're hearing that there's an amount of money that's been quoted to him in those Saudi Arabia countries. It's his decision, but I won't advise him to go there now. I think he has a lot to, to offer in mainstream Europe for a few years before he considers that. That's just my personal opinion. But then, right. they, I mean, he, he, he takes a lot of decisions. And for what a lot of people do not know, Kudus is really, really involved in all the decision making as far as his deals are concerned. He's right. key. He's key, key, key. Mm. He's not that person who sits somewhere for some people to just take the decision for him. Okay. Yeah. So good, uh, people good. underrate a lot of these this, this players, but mm. look, they, some of them are at a different level. At least it's good when you know what is happening. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you don't end up in the blast side of everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, doctor. So, that, so that it doesn't sense. mean that once the thing has expired, you can pay one pound and take him. Uh, uh, okay, I'm not good at football, but then. So don't, don't. The football you, knowledge is bad. You could have Googled it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> 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 and that's what I this morning. We are done. <laughs> <laughs> that would be it. That would be it for the morning. Been, been Still raining. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, then the Greater Accra Division 2 Middle League. The first game was supposed to be at 10. I don't know how the rains are going to affect it. But this afternoon, the weather permitting, there's a big game. A big game. Big game at Accra Sports Stadium. Mm. New Town Stars versus True Democracy. New Town Stars. Yes. In the Greater Accra Division 2 Middle League. Okay. This morning, I think it's Dambot. Dambot and, um, oh, why have I forgotten his other team? Dambot and another team, a, a decider. It should, start at, it should have started at 10 a.m. I don't know if the weather has permitted it to start. But then this afternoon, true democracy versus new town stars. Mm. This game is bigger than a Premier League match. Interesting. Trust me. Interesting. Trust me. And this, this afternoon. At the this afternoon. Okay. The weather permitting. True Maybe democracy versus new town yeah. stars. It's bigger than the Premier League game. What makes it bigger than the Premier League game? The two teams. Okay. They're good. Their fan base is something else. 
Why haven't they, be, why haven't they be qualified to the... Um... So they are playing in the, in the middle league. They started as, as uh, lower division clubs, okay. but they have such a huge following. Right. You know, town. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it looks like the owners are also investing More quite money. a lot in the, mm. in the, in the, in the. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be something else mm. this afternoon at Accra Sports Stadium. Greater Accra Division Two Middle mm. League, True Democracy versus New Town Stars. We pray the rain doesn't doesn't um, yeah, 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 yeah. this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. So the Dam if weather permitting, the Dambot game should be on uh, by now. Right. Mm. Mm. Right. Anyway. Thank <laughs> you.